At the end of 1992, Paul Wolken completed more than 45 consecutive years in the administration of the American Law Institute. He first joined the Institute in the summer of 1947 as assistant to the ALI's new director, Judge Herbert Goodrich, and he continued to hold the title of assistant director until 1977 when he was named executive vice president. In 1963, he had also become executive director of the Aliaba Committee on Continuing Professional Education. And so for nearly 30 years, uh, he was uh, responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the two organizations in their shared Philadelphia headquarters. At the beginning of 1993, he became executive vice president emeritus, and he joined the Institute's council. We're speaking on July 8th, 1993, in the sixth floor studio of the Institute's headquarters in Philadelphia. Now, I doubt that anyone has ever had a more extensive and intensive involvement with the Institute and its many projects and activities than you, and I'm sure that we'll be able to touch on no more than a small fraction of that involvement, but let's begin at the beginning. You're a native of Philadelphia, a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Law School, and you attended the law school in the late 1930s and early 40s at a time when the uh, Institute had its offices right there at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, it was being run still by its original director, William Draper Lewis, out of that small office. Uh, at the law school. Is that when you first became aware of the Institute and its work? Well, I became aware of the Institute when I was a student, and there were the references to the restatement and contracts and the course on torts and other courses, and uh, the restatement was an integral part of our learning, or trying to learn the law of these some subjects. Did, did the uh, professors actually uh, make it part of the curriculum? And, uh, and uh, Well, they... Uh, refer to it for propositions like the uh, contracts professor Foster Reeves uh, would always talk about the restatement sections and the fact mm -hmm. that Pennsylvania hewed very closely mm -hmm. to the restatement if it, indeed it did not adopt sections outright mm -hmm. and uh, in torts which Goodrich uh, taught but I had a I, let's see I had Larry Eldridge for torts and he, of course, emphasized the restatement, so that uh, the restatement was always hovering over our classes at the law school. It was part of the law school culture at that time right. already. Um, now, William Draper Lewis, I guess, was a former dean of, uh, of the law school and had, had taught there. I guess he, he was retired from the faculty by that time? Or? Uh, I think he was retired. He, he was well advanced in age by that time. Mm -hmm. As I recall, uh, he was a tall, individual with white hair and uh, he had a chauffeur driven car and he would be coming in on the, wearing a long black coat with boots and a cold winter and a hat and there'd be fleeting glimpses of him going to the office of the ALI which was on the first floor of the law school I think near the law review office if I remember correctly but he himself didn't at that time have any real contact with the student body? He never gave talks about the Institute or anything to the students? Not that I'm aware of, at least in my uh, mm -hmm. activities there, that did not come across. Right. So when you finished the law school, I guess it was in 1941, you, you then uh, uh, became a law clerk to uh, Judge uh, Herbert Goodrich. Uh, well, that, that, that had a uh, curious twist uh -huh. uh, in my... Uh, second year in law school, I came very ill and in, uh, it was in early November and I was out until uh, the rest of the first semester. And I didn't want to repeat the semester so I sent a letter to the dean who was Goodrich. He said it would be best if I stayed out but I said I'd rather complete it so I went back. The result was that uh, I didn't do too well that year, but in the third year, I, I forgot whether I finished second or third in the class, and uh, things were looking up, but uh, I went around looking for employment with the law offices, large offices in New York, and I think 
story is generally known about the policies of the large law offices there. And I was not doing anything particular for a while. A uh, man with whom I briefed cases, Lippy Redman, went from law school to be Goodrich's clerk. Uh, Lippy was on law review. I tried out for law review, but because of my illness, I had a, was forced to drop out. Well, Lippy was being drafted, and uh, sometime, I, I suppose, in the spring of '42, and uh, the judge asked him who should take his place, and Lippy mentioned me, so. I went down and saw the judge and was hired. That's how I became Goodrich's law clerk. So you, you came in in the middle of the tenure then of, right. uh, of your predecessor. At, at that time, uh, I, I guess the federal judges had only a single law clerk? Is that, at uh, that, that time, the there was only one law clerk. And in the third circuit, there were only five judges. <laughs> and it was a close, intimate relationship between judges and law clerks. Uh, you know, it must have been. And, uh, and they were still time to spare. To spare. Well, I guess the, the, the workload for the judges was not quite what it is now either, although maybe they well, were I don't able know. to get their Good, work done better. Goodrich uh, had the great facility of uh, doing his opinions promptly and quickly. He didn't brood over them. Mm -hmm. And he al always was the first judge at the end of the year to have finished all his cases. Mm -hmm. So uh, whether the load was lighter or not, and he believed in short opinions, mm -hmm. too without the voluminous footnotes. He, he always said God made the world in six days and the seventh day <laughs> rested, and it just shouldn't take any longer to decide a case and write an opinion. Write an opinion. Did, he, did he draft his opinions himself, or did, uh, did he ask? Uh, well, when I went to work for him, I wasn't told what to do. Mm -hmm. He gave me some briefs, and uh, on the brief, it was in, the, the holding was indicated. This temporary decision was indicated. So I sat down and wrote uh, opinions and gave them to the judge and he did what he thought he had to do with them. I see. If he, if he disagreed, he, he was really a generous person. If he disagreed, he would send his draft around with mine attached saying, <laughs> and closes a dissent by Brother Walk. <laughs> and the, your, your, did your dissent sometimes carry the day? With well, a couple times. Judge Jones was who was on the uh, Pennsylvania Third Circuit, who was on the Third Circuit at that time before he went to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, picked up one or two of them and as dissents, and then he was firmed, his dissents prevailed in the Supreme Court. So, so you really had an influence. Well, I had good law <laughs> teachers. I even kept my notes, and yeah. John Mulder taught bankruptcy, and there was one bankruptcy case in which his notes uh -huh. made the law and when it reached the Supreme Court. Well, I know we'll be talking about John Mulder uh, later on, but uh, when you joined uh, Goodrich uh, as, uh, as law clerk, he was already, of course, very active uh, with the Institute. I, I believe his title at that time was uh, Director of Professional Relations. He later, uh, I think in 1945, became Assistant Director, and of course, eventually in 1947, became Director. But uh, uh, at that time, he was clearly doing a lot for the Institute, and did, uh, were you uh, at all aware of that? Did you ever get involved with any of that, or was that Oh, I, I, I was aware that he was uh, very much involved in the work of the Institute. I didn't know the particulars, but he, he was in, had great capacity. He was involved in many things. He was, I think, chairman of the board of the Women's Medical College. He was mm -hmm. president of the National Conference of Christians and Jews. He was abs active in the American Philosophical Society. Learned Hand once sent him a letter extolling his ability to do many things, and he says, you're omni this, omni this, you're omni omni, uh, if I remember the words correctly. But he had that great capacity to do things to do them in a short things. span of time. I, I got the impression from uh, just looking at his reports uh, during this period that his major part of his responsibility in those days with the Institute was developing relationships with the bar, uh, going out and making them aware of the work of the Institute. Uh, he also, I believe, had a good deal of involvement with publication, uh, with working with the with ALI publishers and getting the, the, the works out. Is that your, your record? That's, that's correct. He uh, would meet with the representatives. At that time, the ALI publishers consisted of West Publishing and Lawyers Co-op and the American Law Institute. Right. And there would be periodic meetings over lunch at the, um, I think, St. Regis and New York, 
And uh, that was the time when the favorite item on the menu for this group was Eggs Benedict. Goodrich <laughs> thought that they made the best egg be Eggs Benedict in the country. Right. And we would meet and have a very friendly time talking about publishers, uh, business and matters. So, so you, you, this is why you're still a clerk, or this was later well, on when you... When you uh, I think this was later on, uh, not why. Well, I was a clerk. Uh, I did not get... I was not involved in the Institute too greatly. The first annual meeting I attended was in May of 47, if it was May or June, I forgot which. And that was the meeting at which Goodrich became director. But while I was clerking for the judge, the Institute was meeting in Philadelphia due to the war. And they met at the Bellevue, and he asked me to, if I wanted to go to the meetings, and I attended several sessions. I just sat in as an observer, and that was, I think, my first full exposure to the austere goings-on at the <laughs> Bellevue. Yeah, and I guess you little, <coughs> little imagined at the time that uh, how, 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 how many, how much involvement you would have with those goings on over so many, so many years. Uh, that's correct. Uh, but I attended one or two meetings, and mm -hmm. in 40, 44, I thought I ought to do something else to connect more connected with uh, the war effort. Uh, I'd been turned down by the draft. Uh, this flowed from that illness I had when I was in law school. Right. So uh, I told the judge I was going to go, wanted to leave. And uh, he understood, although he, he seemed to be distressed. And I went to Washington to work for the uh, Foreign Economic Administration. What, what, uh, what, what, what did the Foreign Economic Administration do? That, 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 oh, they, 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 they were in charge of Lend-Lease. Oh. It was an outgrowth of several agencies. There was Lend-Lease Agency, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. and there was the Board of Economic Warfare, mm -hmm. and there were a number of corporations that uh, were involved in procurement for the United States of uh, things that were difficult to get, like rubber. Mm -hmm. And uh, they dealt largely with those matters. The general counsel was a Yale graduate by the name of Oscar Cox. And uh, interestingly enough, Lippy had preceded me there, too. Really? He went from, before he was drafted, he got a war job. He went to the Lend Lease Agency, and then that's how I knew about it. And then I uh, pl applied to foreign, which then, Lend Lease then, then became Foreign Economic Administration. And I applied for the work there in the general counsel's office. And I think Goodrich sent a letter supporting the application. And, and I, when I worked there, I was involved largely in uh, legislative matters. That's where, to my horror, I learned that when there's a legislative hearing, you then get a transcript and rewrite it. Yeah. <laughs> First time you learned about that. Yeah, they, they, were, they also had the Export-Import Bank. I remember working on that legislation. Right. And I remember working on the annual reports of the Lend-Lease Administration. Well, you also uh, were, became involved with the liaison with the French government, was that right? Well, that... that I was with Lend Lease. I was with Foreign Economic Administration when the war ended, mm -hmm. and uh, at that point, uh, many of the activities of the Foreign Economic Administration were being uh, wound up. And the one who, the gentleman who had been Associate General Counsel of FEA or Foreign Economic Administration, was George Ball, and he was very friendly with Monet and. The French to uh, maintain the flow of materials that they were getting under Lend-Lease formed a uh, groupement, that's the type of cor corporation uh, that was responsible for obtaining supplies, continuing the pipeline, as it were, of Lend-Lease. And he became general counsel for the uh, groupement, and I went over there and he worked for him as associate general counsel. And I was with them, the Foreign Economic Administration, for a year. And then someone who I'd known at the uh, Foreign Economic Administration, a man by the name of John Howard, had gone to the State Department, and he suggested I might be interested in going there. So I went from the 
FEA to the, uh, no, from French Supply Council, which was the name of the agency uh, obtaining supplies, to the um, State Department to legal work for it. Right? Yeah, legal advisor. Charles Fay was a legal advisor at that time. But while I was there, uh, my correspondent kept cor corresponding with Judge Goodrich. And uh, if, if memory serves me right, I'm pretty sure this is accurate. He was being actively considered for uh, to be Chief Justice. And one story, in fact, he, it is said, I believe I was told that he was looking for a house in Washington. And in fact, he asked me if I'd be his law clerk if he became Chief Justice. But uh, that may have been after Roosevelt died and Truman came in there, a change of administration that, that fell through. I'd have to check the dates on that, but this is a very vivid recollection, that sequence. Uh, and uh, Vincent, then... Vincent, I guess, was named Chief Justice yeah. around that time, wasn't he? Well, what the sequence there was, I had a discussion of this with Herb Wexler, and we weren't sure of the dates and just how it worked out. But uh, at that time, did you consider uh, staying uh, in, in Washington and government well, service? Well, if the judge w would have gone on the court, I would have stayed. Yeah. But uh, when that didn't materialize, uh, he, in 47, he knew he was going to be director. Yeah. And he knew I wanted to come back to Philadelphia and go mm -hmm. into practice. So he asked me if I wanted to. Uh, help him at the institute on a part-time basis while I could practice right. law. Mm -hmm. And that seemed agreeable, so I went back to Philadelphia in 1947, summer 1947. So, and, uh, so, so, you, so you never considered staying with the, on with the State Department? No, right? no. So you really wanted to come back to Philadelphia, and uh, at that time you saw yourself as a, uh, as a, a practitioner? Well, that, the things were uh, starting to get uh, in some respects difficult in Washington with the uh, hunting witch hunt for communists and uh, not that I ever was a communist uh, but uh, I might, might have contributed to the loyalists in Spain or something like that so I thought it best to go back to uh, Philadelphia and work for some magnificent sum I think it was something like well when I was look like I was getting nineteen hundred dollars a year I'm doing that to shock today's young people and then when I went back to Philadelphia to work for Goodrich, I think I, part-time, I was getting 2600 for half time. Princely sum, I guess. By yeah, comparison. princely sum. Yeah. It was almost like a salary in the Depression. Well, this, uh, of course, uh, was a time of great significance and transition for the Institute in 1947. It wasn't just that uh, Goodrich uh, became the new director, but there were other uh, changes and, uh, and questions about the Institute's direction. Well, also Harrison Tweed became president. He succeeded George Wharton Pepper, right, who became time. chairman of the council, mm -hmm. and Goodrich became director, and I think uh, Lewis, director emeritus, if that was a title. And uh, this was the time when they, uh, leading up to this change in administration, there had been a study by a committee to consider the future of the institute, of which uh, I think Learned Hand was the chair. Uh, there was some thought that, uh, as I recall, that Institute having done most of the restatements it was supposed to do uh, well, should wind up its affairs and it's completed its mission. But there were, uh, I think, some people that felt very strong about not doing it. One of them was uh, William Schneider, they used to call General Schneider, who was uh, active in the uh, work leading up to the commercial code, the Institute had undertaken, I think, before 47, the revision of the Uniform Sales Act with uh, Lowell and his reporter, and I, they were working with the commissioners. And it started out just as a revision of the, uh, that bit of legislation, and uh, Schneider had the rather good, great idea, I thought, of redoing all the commercial laws uh, starting off having them was doing the individual laws. Uh, I'll tell you later how the UCC evolved as a code. Well, I might as well jump ahead. Uh, they were working on uh, se several of the uh, uniform acts, I think bills of notes and uh, bills of lading, and they were drafts extent. And uh, there was one session where I 
So I recall Schneider took his scissors and cut out the sections that were of general application and put them in up front and made a uniform commercial code with scissors and paste out of these separate efforts that were underway. Just, just by uh, well, cutting cut and paste, he moved it up in the front and suddenly realized... Well, that, the, that was to carry out his together. idea to make a... That's entire code out of these uh, various pieces of work that were going on. So, so Schneider was, was the one who really had the inspiration to unify these, these disparate efforts that were going well, on. I think he was, he might, in my mind anyway, properly be called the father of the Uniform Commercial Code. That's why I think there's a chair and pen now on commercial law that right. uh, was in, this, in his name. He was also very active in the commissioners so that uh, he was the glue between the two organizations and uh, he was responsible for the code getting off, the, being drafted, getting off the ground and being enacted in a good part. Of course, the uh, people think of the Institute in that period as being mainly involved with the restatements, but there were a few other projects with the commissioners, I guess, before well, that had laid the groundwork. This wasn't the first uh, involvement with the commissioners, as I recall. Well, there, I, there, there was the... Um, there were several projects that did not involve the restatement. A very important work was done on Youth Correction. There's a Youth Correction Authority Act. Uh, a chap by the name of Ellingston was involved in that. Yes. And uh, there was another piece of legislation. I think there was the, the Uniform Property Act with the, the Kasner was involved with. There was the, the Uniform Property the Act. Uh, they, they had several uh, mm -hmm. pieces of legislative work that were being drafted with and without the commissioners. Right. I think at one time they were talking about a Uniform Aviation Act, even, if mm -hmm. I remember correctly. Yes, there were, there were some drafts of those, of yeah. that, as so, a matter of fact, uh, I believe. The, the, these things preceded me. I think mm -hmm. when I came in, there, there was great activity on these Youth Correction Authority Act, uh, and there was another Youth Act. I forgot the name of it. There were two pieces of legislation, I believe. This was something I gather that uh, Draper Lewis was very interested well, in. Uh, Draper Lewis and uh, Timothy Pfeiffer was very interested and had money. He was a member of the council and a partner, Harrison Tweed, who became president in 1947. And uh, he had he was able to secure funding from the Rockefeller uh, uh, people, I believe, to fund the act. And Ellingston uh, went around trying to uh, have the proposals adopted in various jurisdictions. It was some real pioneering work in, in that field done by the Institute, uh, dealing with a very difficult subject uh, in those days. Did the Institute also review those drafts during that period, were they, or were they... Uh... They were, when I came in, there were reports, uh, whether on, on the status of uh, legislative enactment and likes of that, I don't, rec I don't know whether that went there, through the process. A, as I was doing a little research into that, there was, it was kind of interesting because during the period, I think in the 40s, uh, uh, the late 40s, uh, what was happening was uh, there were reports by Ellingson constantly about uh, legislative enactments, but the Institute itself wasn't doing anything. And in fact, uh, there was some indication that uh, I think Judge Wysanski and Norris Darrell raised questions as to whether the Institute was getting involved in lobbying by, by working for, for the for Well, this and, that's been a recurring concern. Yeah. But uh, all this, we started talking about this because of the change in administration of 47 yeah. when uh, the hand committee uh, did its report on the future of the Institute, right. all with the purpose of saying the work of the Institute was not done, that there was much more work that could be done, and the Institute should not uh, wind up its affairs. Right. Uh, there are a number of projects that they spoke about uh, the corporate work in corporations, which took many years to right. uh, be undertaken. Uh, they spoke about continuing education, continuing legal education. Uh, Harrison Tweed, the new president, uh, was very strongly interested in that subject. And if you read that report, you list uh, more work in restatement. I think it may talk about the Uniform Commercial Code. I'd have to refresh my recollection of about all the uh, project that mentioned. I, uh, I recall uh, also, uh, I don't remember was it, whether it was in that report or not, but Lewis at that time was uh, right before that committee was doing some thinking about it too. And I remember he talked not only about corporations, but also about foreign relations and about criminal law, all, all areas yeah. that later were, uh, were picked up. That, that report was a 
rather far-sighted report, if you look back at it, considering uh, what was going on at that time. And but, uh, of course, it was a crucial period for the Institute because, the, as far as the restatements were concerned, they were winding down, and I guess they finished in 1944, the first restatement. Uh, and uh, my understanding was, I, I, again, I, just, I noticed that, uh, that there was a three-year period uh, uh, where they were not to do any further work on the restatement that was part of the... Uh, of the uh, uh, requirements of the uh, of the grant, the original grant from uh, from uh, Carnegie, and uh, then they were only to uh, 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 begin. Uh, the, then after the three-year period, they could begin work again. I guess that's when the revisions uh, that well, the revisions began. Right? They started a process of keeping the restatement up to date. Yeah, that was, I think, Goodrich's uh, mm -hmm. suggestion, in which uh, they would take each re various restatements had a reporter designated and not revise the entire restatement but to uh, deal with new developments yeah. in restatement format and I think there was conflict of laws was one subject and uh, uh, torts may have been another and they published very slim pamphlets they, these were considered at the uh, at the annual meeting they were reviewed uh, I think around 1948 uh, yeah, well, I think they, yeah, they, 1948, started in 47 and likes of that. And uh, that kept the Institute busy be until they decided to go into total revision of a restatement. And about that time, too, one of the things Goodrich, in working with the publishers, uh, had an interest in, and I think Lewis, too, originally there was something called annotations to the restatement. And that project uh, goes back, I think, to the Depression and was funded in part by WPA uh, to uh, help penniless lawyers survive the Depression. And what it involved was uh, annotating the restatement to the law of a particular, each particular state. And there are a great many of those annotations uh, that were developed, and they, some of them are very helpful and, and very, very good in dealing with the local law. But that then, uh, I think this was Goodrich's idea, gave birth to an, another venture, and that was the restatement in the courts, whereby uh, the citations of cases in which the restatement was cited were sent to the Institute by uh, Shepherds, I believe, and West also, and the institute uh, would digest, uh, digest those, some, somebody, institute would hire someone uh, to digest the paragraph digest of any case citing a restatement, restatement and showing whether it's cited in support or dissent. And these were published, uh, I think, each year as supplements uh, to the, to um, various restatements uh, products. They used to be all uh, in a single volume, all the restatements put together. Yeah, and then and then ultimately that let the, they developed the present system, mm -hmm. uh, which they, have, they stopped publishing the annotations because they fell into disuse of West Publishing, had a large inventory which it wanted to dispose of, mm -hmm. and they said it wasn't profitable to deal with the state annotations anymore, and besides, the depression was over. Yeah. So they then work continued in the restatement of the courts, and which developed into its present format, mm -hmm. and that has been a source of substantial revenue for the Institute. Yes. Uh, can we uh, focus for a minute on, on the, the 1947, when you actually came to work for the, for the Institute? Uh, I, I, interested to know what the situation was like, the conditions then. You were you start off still in that office at the University of Pennsylvania in 1947? Yeah, um, Martha used to say that when I started, the Institute consisted of two rooms and two clerks or secretaries, Goodrich and myself, which was an accurate description. They were two rooms on the ground floor I suppose that's, that was the office where Lewis uh, Same office. had uh, his offices. And there was a glass partition dividing one room. That's how we got two rooms. And on one side, there were two desks, that one of which I used and one of which Judge Goodrich used when he came 
this, he did most of his work at Chambers. And on the other side, there, were, there was Eleanor Tuig, who was the uh, uh, chief uh, secretary, I suppose, and a woman by the name of Betty Ferguson, who was her assistant. And that was the staff of the Institute. In those days, uh, minutes were done on a ditto machine. I don't know how many people know what a ditto machine is. It's a blue ink, and you rolled it out. I, I remember them. And if it had to have a longer run, they, there were stencils that were cut on a typewriter. Mm -hmm. And the Institute's inventory and files were in the basement of the law school, which periodically would be flooded so that much, many items of historical items of old files have, were destroyed, really? as well as books. And also some of it was chewed up by the rats that used to run around down in the basement mm. of the law school. Yeah. So uh, Eleanor Tuick, she had a lot of courage. Uh, we decided we'd clean out the basement. <laughs> she and Betty went down and uh, they got rid of a lot of stuff, maybe, that's, maybe papers we should have retained, but they were in very poor condition. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what happened. Sorry. And then uh, it was a very meager office. I, I don't know whether they had two typewriters or one typewriter. No, no such thing as a dictating machine. Uh, Judge Goodrich wrote his opinions longhand, or occasionally would dictate to his secretary downtown. But this, m much of the material for the institute, much of the material was done down at downtown or he'd come out the office once so we can do it there. I wrote everything out by longhand and uh, that was the uh, way we worked then. Well, what, what uh, sort of work did you yourself do when you first started? Well, uh, I was working on a restatement in the courts, getting people to do it. I, I had to engage people to, uh, we paid them I think 25 cents a uh, Digest. That's what we still do, although we pay a little more than that now, I yeah. think. And, well, of course, sometimes in one case would hit a gold mine, it'd be uh, mm -hmm. 25 citations. Mm -hmm. So they'd use the same digest for all 25 right. citations. <laughs> and then uh, at that time, they wanted to do, they, the Wells had written commentaries to the uh, sales article mm -hmm. or the Revi Uniform Revised Sales Act that they'd prepared. And they were much too voluminous. So uh, one of the things I did in those days was condense those comments to the uh, Sales Act. And uh, also about in 47, 48, th there was interest in doing work in taxation. And uh, Norris Darrell was a tax lawyer, a new member of the council, or was to become a member of the council. And it was a question of uh, obtaining grant funds. And I was writing prospectuses for uh, doing work in taxation. And in perhaps in the in that, others of prospectuses. Uh -huh. In that connection, I saw uh, something kind of interesting that apparently the, uh, the council decided to leave it up to the, I think it was the Falk Foundation, whether to do tax or to do a project in corporate law. And I, uh, and I, and I, I gather once again corporate law at that time uh, lost out, just as they had earlier when it was a choice between uh, security and, 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 and corporations law. At least there's, there's something in the, uh, in the minutes that suggested that it was well, left up to the foundation. Well, there was a lot of ferment uh -huh. in taxation in those days. Yeah. And uh, I think in 1947 or 48, Congress enacted a tax law to make applicable to all the jurisdictions the benefits of community property states. Right. Uh, and uh, there was talk of other tax revision. So it seemed to be a moment where work by the Institute in taxation would make a significant contribution. Mm -hmm. And especially since Norris Darrell was a tax lawyer, there was great, he spurred the interest in doing that kind of work. Was there a, a good deal of skepticism at the time about that being an appropriate subject for the Institute? It certainly is. Well, uh, there's uh, always a, yeah. an element of skepticism any project the Institute wants to undertake. Sure. And it depends what the administration wants to uh, mm -hmm. pursue that, as to how it turns out. And uh, Judge Goodrich, I guess, uh, 
Yeah, yeah Judge, was, Judge Goodrich was very much interested in taxation. Being a federal judge, he had many tax cases on his docket that he dealt with, and he knew the uh, importance of having good tax legislation. And the, and the co taxation concepts were changing in those days. And, uh, there, there was there was work to be done in the field, and the institute uh, thought it might right. be an opportunity. In fact, the, the work it ended up doing after it got the money was very significant. Uh, Stanley Surrey became the chief reporter. He'd been in government, and yeah. Dean Warren of Columbia was the associate reporter. And the work they did uh, on the federal income tax uh, law was uh, made, made significant contributions to tax law. And from that, of course, after that, they went on to other things in taxation. Yes, right up to the present. The had well, a, uh, after a while, uh, th there was not too great interest in continuing work on taxation. And uh, I worked closely with Stanley Surrey in trying to stir up interest and uh, was successful in reviving interest in taxation. And after once we got it going, there became an interesting subject to the members of the council yeah. and other projects who were authorized with uh, uh, Jim Kasner and sure. we moved on from there to many other tax projects. Yeah. Right up to the present, uh, tax involvement. Well, one uh, uh, area that you, that, you, that you haven't mentioned yet um, is, uh, of course, one with which you became so closely involved. Uh, uh, continuing legal education. You did mention uh, that, that uh, the uh, committee had recommended an involvement, and the involvement did begin around that uh, period, but I take it at first you were not uh, involved in it. Uh. No, that's correct. What, what, in 1947, uh, the Institute approved the project of continuing, educa continuing legal education. That's a big story in itself. It, it grew out of the uh, <clears throat> World War II, there was a, a perceived need to do something for lawyer veterans who would be returning, lawyer soldiers who would become veterans in return. And the, the uh, thought was to have, do some work, programs continuing legal education for them. And uh, Goodrich and uh, Tweed were very much interested in that, but the American Bar Association worked with the Practicing Law Institute and had programs uh, for lawyers in various parts all over the country. Uh, in connection with that, the Practicing Law Institute undertook publication of uh, little booklets uh, on select subjects. Indeed, uh, I prepared one on uh, this was, I started on this when I was in Washington, a suggestion of Judge Goodrich on uh, Erie Railroad versus Tompkins, uh, which grew out of an article I'd written at the judges prompting on this for Penn Law Review. And, uh, but there, there seemed to be uh, some degree of uh, discontent about the way the continuing education program was going forward for returning veterans. And uh, Ultimately, the American Bar Association uh, asked the American Law Institute to undertake uh, a program with its cooperation. I guess Harrison Tweed worked that out with uh, the powers of being the American Bar Association, whom we knew well, and, and that's how the Institute, uh, in as early as 47, uh, started on uh, and continuing legal education. The initial problem was to select, uh, well, the initial problem was to get some money and to select the director. And Harrison Tweed was successful in getting uh, a quarter of a million dollars from the Carnegie Corporation to fund the effort. And uh, I think Goodrich is the one who put forward John Mulder as the first director. John Mulder had been a law professor at Penn. And during the war, when Penn's faculty contracted, he went to work as uh, the Schneider off, Officer Schneider, Schneider downtown. And Goodrich put John forward as, and with Tweed's support as the director for his, this new enterprise, the joint, uh, the ALI's effort in CLE with the cooperation of uh, 
the American Bar Association, and the two, uh, the grant was obtained and Mulder was approved, and things moved rapidly. Then it's a question of getting a place for this uh, enterprise to be headquartered. There was no room in the law school, so uh, John Mulder located a place at 36th and Walnut. There's a bank building there on the northeast corner, and uh, he was rented the loft of that building. And the elevator went to the fifth floor, and you had to walk up to the sixth floor. But the view from the sixth floor was, you saw the entire city of Philadelphia. This was before they had built a building facing that. And uh, in the summer of, uh, or fall of uh, 47, or shortly thereafter, is when John started off CLE for the Institute. Uh, sometime very soon following that, uh, the, uh, I think the, the dean at the law school was a, at the time, Judge Justice Roberts became dean of the Penn Law School. And for some reason, he wanted that space that the uh, Institute occupied. So we were asked to leave. And we moved in with, into the loft space at 36th and Walnut. And uh, it wasn't bad. And the offices were rather nice there for the, those days. We, wasn't initially air conditioned, but we got air conditioners and so forth and so on. And, uh, and there were some new staff brought in to work on the Aliab. Uh... Well, John organized the staff. Uh, he hired a lawyer. He, and shortly thereafter, he hired uh, for the bookkeeping a young veteran by the name of Walter McLaughlin, who just recently, I think, uh, well, maybe it was a little later, he left the, uh, he'd been in the army. When was the Korean War? Uh, started in 1950. Yeah, well, I, well and, so uh, it was sometime after that that he hired, mm -hmm. hired Walt to do the bookkeeping. So he must have had somebody else mm -hmm. he had uh, working there. And uh, John started CLE uh, by, uh, there, there was a Midwestern director, Charlie Joyner, judge, now Judge Joyner, and there was a Western director, Professor Brenner, I think. And the idea was to encourage loca local bars to uh, get involved in CLE. And John was spurred that movement. This is uh, what uh, I believe uh, Mulder called the grassroots approach. That's and, right, uh, yeah. And, uh, uh, and the other thing he started, he started the, the education he started was preparing literature, he used to call it, uh, little pamphlets on pretty much the way PLI had done with, uh, with its program for returning veterans. And John had many students, and he prevailed upon a number of them to uh, write book on taxation, various subjects, and these little pamphlets were the initial uh, effort and publications by uh, Ali Abba. Well, I, I, I really enjoyed this. I, 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 well, I good. hope. Good. Well, we can tell We're going every day for a couple of years. We could very easily. <laughs> get the, I mean, 45 years is a lot of ground to cover. We have to get the. Very good. I want to see what they say men about members. We're resuming our discussion with Paul Wolken on July 9th, 1993. And yesterday, when we, uh, we had reached the point in our discussion uh, in which we were just talking about the uh, Ali Abba uh, establishment uh, in 1947 in the same office as uh, the ALI offices. And uh, I wanted to ask you this. Uh, I think we did make it clear that at the beginning, at least, you were not brought in for the purposes of doing anything with Ali Abba. That, that, that began later on. So my question that I wanted to ask you was, is how did you, in fact, become involved with Ali Abba? Was it a slow process, a gradual process? Or? Well, uh, the, as, as I think I mentioned yesterday, uh, Ali Abba leased offices at 36th and Walnut on some loft space, and they moved into those offices first. And shortly thereafter, ALI was asked to leave the law school because the law school needed a space. So we moved over to the same address and the same floor, the, the uh, loft space at uh, 
one, I think it's 133 South 36th Street. And uh, there I was in intimate communication with John Mulder, who was the director of Ali Abba, although I continued to work uh, primarily and indeed solely on uh, Institute matters. But uh, with the passing of weeks and months, I came to know more about uh, Ali Abba and what it was involved in. And uh, I think in the very early 50s, uh, I suggested to John that we, Ali Abba should publish a periodical that would do in periodical format what his handbooks, his literature of handbooks, was doing more extensively. One of his handbooks, a uh, typical handbook, would be 50, 75, 100 pages. And uh, my thought was that uh, it would be well to have articles of 5, 10 or so pages uh, that would be practical, minimum no citations, but would offer how to do it advice. And uh, he, he, I think, liked the idea. And then we discussed it with uh, Judge Goodrich and Harrison Tweed who were the uh, major movers uh, for the committee. And uh, it was an evolving process. We uh, took it up with uh, uh, the meeting of the uh, Ali Abba committee. And uh, after extensive discussion, they approved it. And I think it was even taken up at a meeting of the ALI executive committee. And the proposal was approved. Uh, the um, we got to work then. And we had the services of Al Lefton's advertising agency that drew up an advertisement piece uh, to solicit subscriptions. Uh, we solicited articles. And uh, I think about 1953 or early 1954, we sent out a limited number of uh, solicitations for subscriptions. The, uh, at that time, it was eight issues for, I think, $6 which was uh, a large sum, I suppose. But uh, the initial solicitation effort brought in 10,000 subscribers. Uh, it was a return that was very impressive uh, for those in this business. And then we had another one, came to 15,000. And I think the first one was published uh, late in 1954, early in 1955. And it was an inst instant success. Uh, Tweed thought up the name of the practical lawyer. I think he got it from the practical navigator. Wasn't navigator, it? Yeah. and uh, that seemed to fly well. And uh, that was the story. Thereafter, we'd set up a little editorial board. John Mulder was the chairman of it. I was the editor. And uh, from that time on, I spent part of my time working on the practical lawyer, and part of the time on. Uh, Institute Matters. Uh, Judge Goodrich thought it appropriate that in submitting reports to the annual meeting, there'd be one, his report, and there'd be John Mulder's report, and there'd be a separate report on the practical lawyer. So that was the plan that was followed for uh, quite a while. Being involved with the practical lawyer, I uh, became still more closely involved with the work of the Ali Abba Committee. I started attending meetings of that committee. Uh, when they met in Chicago and, and Washington. And uh, one thing led to another and had more ideas for the committee. And that was my uh, involvement initially until, I think, uh, 1963 or so, when John Mulder uh, stepped down as director and uh, was agreed that I would succeed him as director of Ali Abba. That was approved initially by, uh, I think, Herb Wexler and Nara Starrow and I think Harrison Tweed. The, and that uh, started the Ali Abba affair. And the, uh, the practical lawyer was, a, as you indicated, I guess, was a great money maker uh, and made a big difference financially for the uh, fledgling operation. Well, it, it made a significant contribution because. Uh, you may recall that the initial grant from Carnegie was $250,000. <clears> and uh, that was about to be exhausted uh, because John Mulder was subsidizing a lot of uh, the effort that Ali Abba was subsidizing it of spreading the word about CLE. And uh, 
there was talk of uh, what we, of maybe terminating the committee when we ran out of funds. <clears throat> but the practical lawyer, uh, even at six dollars a subscription, uh, yielded ample revenue to support the work of the committee and for the thereafter. To really turn things around. Yeah, that, that was a crucial move. And mm -hmm. not only that, but I, I think uh, not only was the uh, financial end significant, but the practical lawyer was the first periodical in the country to treat material the way uh, it did, uh, short, concise, how to do articles. Now there, practically every uh, state bar has a publication. The ABA has publication like that. It's become rather commonplace to have how to do it uh, articles and featured in bar publications. Do you remember how you came up with the idea? Was it a sudden inspiration, or were you influenced by something else? Sudden inspiration is the answer. <laughs> Pure genius, right? Well, I don't know if I'd go that far, but it was uh, seeing a set of facts and realizing that there was an opportunity for uh, something different that yeah. would fit in to the environment uh, of those facts. Mm -hmm. Well, during that that period of the uh, from the late '40s. It, through the 50s into the 60s when you became the uh, executive director, there was a uh, clearly a gradual change that took place in the approach and the philosophy of Aliyah, but that was uh, the practical lawyer was obviously one aspect of it. But that grassroots approach that we talked about, that, that, uh, that uh, to use, I guess, Mulder's own phrase, uh, gradually evolved and changed. Uh, uh, didn't, and I'm wondering if you could tell us how that came to, to be. Well, what happened uh, was that the, the idea of continuing legal education rapidly took hold in the profession in, in those uh, 10 or so, 15 years. One of the things that uh, stimulated the growth was an Arden House conference that, w that was held, I think, in 1953, I believe. I think 58 was the first one, wasn't was it? Was 58 the no, first it was one? 63 the second. Well, maybe it's 58. And the, that, that Arden House conference, um, it's in that book there, we can look it up. That Arden House conference uh, was, it, it was a, an important event in continuing legal education. Invited were uh, bar leaders uh, like John Lord O'Brien, Irwin Griswold, uh, uh, Judge Hand, and also bar association officials. And by that time, uh, the idea be began to take hold of the state bar having a person in charge of continuing legal education, an official administrator, profish, and a professional administrator. And it may have been by the time of the Arden House Conference, uh, four or five such. Uh, Felix Stumpf is one of them, and there were some others. But the, one, one of the uh, recommendations that came out of the Arden House Conference uh, was that every state should have a CLE program and that it should be in charge of a professional administrator who would conduct uh, operations and be responsible for the program, uh, plus a committee to support the administrator and so forth. And Arden House, one, gave great impetus to that idea and uh, there, in the uh, Few year, in the years that followed, one of the primary aims of the committee was to encourage this movement. Uh, there were other recommendations in the Arden House uh, One report, but I think that may have been among, if not the most important one, because the appointment of administrators and have someone in full charge of a program at the local level uh, was a great impetus towards develop, further development. And uh, that, so that changed. States began to conduct their own programs. Uh, in the past, uh, Ali Abbott had been doing programs. For example, I went down and lectured on partnership law all through North Carolina, little towns at one point. Uh, and uh, there were others who lectured on taxation at the local level, well, at the uh, instance of Ali Abba. With the growth of state administrators, they took over that function. So uh, gradually, the emphasis and programming shifted to, in addition to publications, to holding our sponsoring programs directly on subjects of national interest. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I, that, that was just starting to happen when uh, I became director and uh, that became an important part of the program thereafter because it not only contributed significantly to uh, the know-how in the field but uh, to the finances of the Alley Abbott Committee. Uh, you were right, the second Art and House Conference, you were right on the 58th day because the second Art and House Conference was held in 63 when I became director. I remember I was told I'd be director at a meeting of the Council in New York in December and from there we went to Art and House for the Art and House II Conference and I was asked to speak there so uh, that, that was the chain of events. But by going into national programming on courses uh, we, we made a big difference, uh, and it was interesting how eagerly, uh, the res how eager the response was. We had programs with hundreds of people in attendance. Uh, Mendy Hirschman always reveled in the story that um, he had a real estate program that he inaugurated in California. They put us in a coconut grove at the, I think, the Ambassador Hotel, and there he was and his cohorts performing in a nightclub on a very serious subject. But uh, the audience was so large, we just had no other choice. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I, I certainly got the impression that in the early days, uh, uh, you, you, I think you described it in, that, in your book as uh, the missionaries going out and uh, uh, moving across the country, uh, especially the, with, the, with, the, with the West Coast representative and the, and the Central representative moving around. Uh, 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 spreading the gospel of, uh, of CLE, but basically doing it through encouragement of local organizations. Uh, and then, uh, as you say, you, there was clearly this movement toward the national uh, national uh, programs uh, being created uh, as well as being facilitated uh, by, by, by Ali Abba. Was there any controversy about that? Uh, were there people that felt that uh, Ali Abba should have kept to the grassroots policy? or? Uh? Well, I, I don't... That, that was the subject of discussions at committee meetings, but I don't think there was any uh, great controversy. W what we were doing starting in 60 th 63 was expanding the program. We increased the number of publications. Our publications became larger, and uh, each book uh, more comprehensive and more complete. And our programs uh, did, it became uh, of a two-, three-day duration leading ultimately to the idea of having week-long courses in the summer, mm -hmm. uh, starting with one, I think, in Madison, Wisconsin, on, at the University of Wisconsin on Uniform Commercial Code. And uh, the, the only controversy that emerged out of this, what I call success story, was that uh, some individuals in the American Bar Association at that point realized the potential that continuing legal education had for uh, activities of a bar association, and they thought this was something that uh, the, bar, the American Bar Association should become involved in and, and take back, as it were, having asked us to do it initially. I might say that in that, between those two periods, Harrison Tweed was almost from the very beginning insistent that the ABA play a larger role in Ali Abba. Originally, uh, Ali Abba had uh, the larger representation I mean, the ABA was just cooperating, and he was very much engaged in involving the ABA to a greater extent, not monetarily, but yeah. to have equal representation, equal participation. Uh, he uh, worked closely with the uh, ABA, former future president Ross Malone, who was of the same mind, and uh, another ABA president uh, became a judge, Wally Craig, uh, to have a closer relationship and more involvement. But uh, the pull in Chicago was in the direction of pulling out of Ali Abba. Uh, there's an interesting uh, episode. We had a meeting in uh, New York, and uh, to involve closer integration, I proposed that uh, every section have a CLE committee, and the CLE chairman of each section be an advisory committee to the Ali Abba committee. Well, that almost set the ABA house on fire because uh, an order came down and joining, as it were, anybody from ABA and pursuing this or participating in the events of Ali Abba. And there was serious talk of uh, dissolving the participation, the partnership. 
Uh, that went on for uh, quite a while, and it uh, wasn't until people like uh, President Gossett and Bernie Siegel became held high office in ABA that there was a uh, softening of an attitude uh, and uh, closer cooperation, but the price paid for that in, in, over negotiations was that ABA uh, received consent quote, consent or agreement from Ali Abba that ABA had, could have a CLE program of its own and that they, but they would be coordinated. But ever, e even though peace was established and there was no dissolution, uh, the result was that ABA had an active program of continuing legal education. And it's interesting uh, that uh, although Ali Abba had the ABA name in it, and ABA participation as half the members were ABA. Uh, even to this day, ABA never fully acknowledged that Ali Abba was doing important work for ABA members, as it were. And uh, uh, that's just a peculiar thing. Now, uh, now, as you know, they're talking about merging uh, what ABA is doing with Ali Abba and forming a new entity for reasons that involve finances and matters like that. But uh, this, that, that period when there was uh, the movement or separation was a difficult period, but we, we were prepared to uh, go it alone. We were thinking of what steps we would take if there were a, a, a separation or dissolution, what we would call the enterprise, how we would proceed. I never had any doubt that uh, if there had been a separation, Ali Abba would have been successful. Or what was the, 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 the ALI interest, uh, going it alone, would have been very successful and would have uh, succeeded. But I also always thought it would be better to have ABA as a co-participant uh, because it uh, gave the entity greater universality in the country. I get, uh, the reason that ABA uh, uh, developed uh, its own separate uh, uh, CLE branch I, was because of the, large, largely because it was becoming such a successful thing, is that? Uh, is well, that it the, became a successful thing, and uh, Bert Early, who was director of, uh, the executive director of ABA, had the correct belief that it would be a great membership uh, attraction, uh, that uh, more members would join ABA if they knew that there was a, uh, strong uh, CLE program that was being conducted by its sections and divisions, and uh, he thought that uh, that would be something that would boost ABA membership and the finances and activities. Right. Well, you've, uh, uh, of course, have watched all of this, and there's, there have been these continual up and downs, I guess, for, th for, for 30 years. Uh, the relationship between ALI and ABA. There's been a lot of periods of where there have been talks about ABA pulling out and then talks about merger and of course we I guess where there's another period right now. You actually uh, had another suggestion I believe uh, 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 instead of a merger. Uh, when currently? Uh, recently. Well right? my, yeah. my current, uh, I, uh, the, the, there, there was a committee appointed and this all came about when it was agreed that I would leave ALI and Ali Abba and do other things, and the successor had to be selected. So uh, it was determined that there ought to be a search committee, and the search committee should also then consider the idea of merger. Right. And uh, the president of ALI, Rod Perkins, asked me who should be on the committee, and I suggested most of the individuals that are on there, or the, the only others that are on the committee were proposed by ABA uh, representatives as for their end of the participation. And uh, they, they prepared a paper uh, outlining the format if they agree there should be a merger and they form a new 501c3 corporation and, and uh, this new entity would take over the assets of the ABA division on CLE, their copyrights and their inventory and the assets of Ali Abba, uh, and would conduct continuing legal education as an independent, separate, nonprofit entity. 
uh, and would do the, all the operations would take place in Philadelphia, the work. And it occurred to me that there was, rather than go to something that elaborate, there's a much simpler procedure, and that is that uh, Ali Abbott could do everything they said could be done by Merge Corporation. The Chicago office, which was to be continued under their plan for dealing with sections, would remain in Chicago. And uh, without transferring assets, uh, we would accomplish all the objectives that they had in mind, the committee had in mind, uh, with the least difficulties, uh, because there was a lot, there's a lot of uh, opinion that the merger is not desirable, and the two entities should remain separate. But uh, if there is a reason to combine them, it seems to me that uh, this is the simplest way to do it. And it would uh, save money on both ends. Uh, uh, a ABA would have substantial savings, and we would continue along our way. And merge th this entity taking, oh, yeah, but taking over the activities of uh, many of the activities of uh, ABA other than, uh, and still preserving the integrity of the sections would accomplish the objectives of, in an e easier, more efficient way. Whether that would be accepted remains to be seen. Yeah, as we speak now, we still don't know what's going to happen, so. No, no. That committee is holding hearings and having testimony and. Well, perhaps we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, moving right up to the present. We could get, we could get back to the, uh, a uh, little bit further and, uh, and talk about some of the other, uh, uh developments, uh, particularly after you, you took over as the executive director. And one thing that struck me particularly always is that you have always been extremely alert to the possibility of new ways of delivering CLE, new technology, and so forth. Uh, well, it, it, all that is a long story, and it's in a yeah. book that, right. called Ali Abba Excel, which right. is available from Ali Abba. It tells the history right. of the first 40 years of Ali Abba. And one of the things that mm -hmm. it Two of the things it stresses are that while courses and uh, publications are the standard uh, means of delivering CLE, that CLE should be concerned with matters beyond those things. On the delivery end, uh, there was the, uh, that the there you should be made of television uh, of uh, telecasting programs mm -hmm. and we had the first uh, programs some years ago uh, they were uh, we had I think 10 programs that emanated from WGBH in Boston and went to a number of sites uh, and then we used Philadelphia studio and ABA joined us and ultimately PLI and we now have uh, the American Law Network, which uh, does 30, 40 programs a year, and they telecast them, and it goes out all over the country. So that was one innovation. The other, the other innovations, uh, very early, it occurred that we ought to tape our programs, audio tape them, and uh, do some modest editing of the audio tapes and make them available to lawyers who are, are unable to attend. And that became uh, very uh, popular, especially in jurisdictions where uh, th there were vast areas to be traversed by lawyers in their cars, and they could take the tapes and listen to programs in, in their cars. Uh, and uh, it's funny, somebody told me a story that their children were driving with him, and he was playing a tape that we did on broker-dealers. And then originally that was taped by a lawyer in Philadelphia, Gordon Cooney, was the chair. The, kid, the kids in the car were, there's Gordon again, <laughs> when the father turned on that tape. Uh, so that was one. Then we went into videotapes, uh, which was another natural. And we experimented with computer-assisted uh, instruction through uh, Cali, which is a law school organization. And, uh, that's involved in uh, computer-assisted learning, and we had some of their materials converted for uh, use by lawyers. So the finding new delivery methods uh, of CLE was an important part of the endeavor to make the subject teachings more widely available. The, the other phase that I had strong belief in was that CLE should do something to improve the profession and professional competence. And uh, we uh, 
started, ha we had conferences. We had a conference on, on revising the bankruptcy law. And we call those invitational conferences. People were invited to attend, and uh, they were participatory, pretty much like an ALI meeting. The uh, proposition would be advanced, and there would be discussion from the floor. And we, uh, in addition to these invitational conferences, we had specific projects. We had a project on uh, the structure and curriculum of CLE, in which we had a reporter and advisors. And they spent some time and came out with a very interesting document. We had another project uh, had the idea that uh, peer review would be a good way to advance competence. Uh, in other words, uh, lawyers' performance would be reviewed by peers and handled that way. And we developed a very fine proposal under a member of the committee who just died last week. Haskell Cohn was the chair of it, and he was uh, fully supportive of it and uh, had a good advisory committee and reporter. And we came out with a peer review project, but uh, lawyers didn't cotton to it. So we had a, we called an invitational conference in Williamsburg on peer review, and uh, in which we had a small conference. Lawyers were present. We talked about peer review in other professions. Uh, Susan Martin was the reporter for that. And uh, we solicited the views of the attendees, and Peer review was of little interest, no interest to them. They thought they didn't need any, lawyers didn't need anyone to tell them how to do their job better. They could do it best themselves. From that, we went into uh, two other projects, one on enhancing professional competence, uh, which is a very fine document that uh, Haskell, the committee had an advisory committee of reporters. That uh, This committee was chaired by Haskell Cohn, and that came out with a couple of years ago with an excellent report, recommendations that deal with conflict of interest on how you start a representation, how you terminate it with alternative dispute resolution. There's a wealth of material there, whether it's being used to that or no. And then we had still another project going forward on enhancing the quality of CLE. Uh, how can we improve the quality of CLE? Uh, Felix Stumpf was the reporter on that. Again, he had a group of advisors and a superb report came out which if every CLE organization observed, I think would really improve the quality of what lawyers are taught. But all these projects, uh, the, uh, the latter kind, the uh, peer review and CLE curriculum and quality were, were subsidized by the Ali Abba Committee. Uh, we had no outside grants for them. And that's how we used the profits that we made on courses and books. Uh, books were never a great profit-making venture. Most of the real revenue came from courses, but they also helped support the public publication of our books, which are carefully edited, deal with rive subjects, and I think make a real contribution. And our aim was to devote revenues that we earned elsewhere to what I think uh, Ted called, calls pro bono activities, pro bono publico. Right. And that's what we did. Uh, then came the recession uh, two years ago when we had a very substantial loss, which was most unusual for us. The loss was unusual and the amount of it was unusual. Yeah. So we had to retrench a bit. We uh, stopped certain projects. Uh, we, we had a project going on uh, learning for lawyers, uh, and uh, we, we helped we had to have some retrenchment in the staff. But there was a very quick turnaround, and uh, the following year we had a very substantial profit. And now there's opportunity for the committee to do some of these things again. I understand there's interest in reviving that uh, project on adult education. And so yeah, on. yeah. It's a question of how fast they get going on it. It's a good project. Clearly, one of your major interests all the way through this has been the educational process and, uh, and, and how it can be improved. Uh, I noticed in your book there was reference also to a rather uh, ambitious plan at one time back in the late 1960s to, to look at the entire process, as I understand it, of legal education. Uh, Wirtz was to be the, Willard Wirtz was yeah, to be the Yeah, he did a that. preliminary study of that and uh, came out with a superb report uh, that would look at 
the education from cradle to grave, as it were, that required substantial financing, which wasn't available. Uh, more recently, uh, Bob McCrate was chair of an ABA commission on legal education. And when he discovered this Wirtz report that we had worked on, he was really uh, taken by it as, a, as being the very thing he had in mind. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, what uh, Willard Wirtz recommended uh, shows up in, in the McCrate report, which mm -hmm. came out just last summer, I think. So sometimes the influence of these projects is a little slow, but the, they're out there and they, they eventually do have impact. Well, it's in a sense, it's similar to uh, ALI endeavors. ALI uh, does a code of criminal procedure or uh, model land development code, and uh, it promulgates it after many years of work and dollars spent and says, here it is. It doesn't try to get anyone to enact it, but mm -hmm. uh, it puts it out, and then anyone who's interested in those subjects and knows about it can avail mm -hmm. uh, himself or herself of it to, uh, as a model for, for legislation. Uh, was peer review one that you were particularly disappointed uh, in that it didn't go more quickly or have more of an impact? Uh, well, I, I thought peer review was uh, an interesting uh, experiment that's going on to some extent in the hospitals and the medical field. Mm -hmm. It's going on, I think, in accountancy uh, has right. a very extensive elaborate peer review where, in, I don't know if it's still continuing, but mm -hmm. under the program, uh, accountants from other firms come in and audit a firm's performance mm -hmm. and publish a report. And uh, it presumably has had significant impact on the quality of practice in accountancy. And engineers have some form, I believe. Uh, the only ones who really, to whom it was anathema, are, are lawyers. But some of the uh, the uh, insights of that peer review project, as I understand, that are now being utilized in self-assessment projects. If the lawyers can't won't be reviewed by others, they might perhaps uh, use it to look at themselves and examine themselves. Is well, if they will, uh, the one of one of the contributions. Uh, significant contribution to the peer review project was his definition, I think, of competence. Right. And that's been found its way into the uh, code, is it the Code of Professional Responsibility? What do they call it? The ABA rules. Uh, the rules, I think, is the rules. Yeah, and, uh, it's in, and in other uh, documents uh, of a similar nature. Mm -hmm. So that, that made a contribution in that respect. Uh, Doug Rosenthal, I worked on that and I think worked that out and made a helpful uh, contribution right. by that definition. But uh, talking about self-assessment, that, that brings to mind another project that uh, Ali Abba has been pursuing, and that is to develop self-assessment tests in specific subjects. A lawyer can test the degree of his knowledge in a given field by taking these tests. It's uh, non-threatening. He can do it in a, a privacy. There's no public record of it. And then that would point out his weaknesses, uh, if any, and, or her weaknesses, if any, and uh, he could, she, he or she could do something about it. Mm -hmm. uh, when I left, they were pursuing that in several subjects, and they were waiting for the publication. Mm -hmm. So, really, under your leadership, uh, the AL, uh, Ali Abba, uh, I think, uh, was remarkable for the variety of delivery methods you developed, and also for the the. the pedagogical theory that you, you uh, and ideas that were sparked and generated by these, these projects. On, on the delivery, uh, uh, just a question or two, uh, clearly uh, uh, by having various kinds of delivery methods, uh, video courses, books and so forth, you clearly increase the options uh, for, for lawyers and the possibilities. Uh, does that create any problem for, did you feel that ever created a problem for the organization and that we, find, that we, we, we start competing with ourselves in different... Uh, oh, I, I never had that thought. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that it occurred to you. <laughs> uh, as far as I know, there's no evidence of it. Uh, of course, you know, when, when you have a program and you make audio tapes and then you put out audio tapes, uh, the thought occurs that maybe people are not going to come to the program, they're going to yeah. wait for the audio tapes, but yeah. I don't think there's any evidence of that. Mm -hmm. 
and to the contrary, I think listening to the audio tapes might encourage lawyers to attend programs. Because that, that's still the value of attending a program is the sure. interchange, the interaction with mm -hmm. other lawyers, mm -hmm. the ability to go up and talk to faculty members, ask questions. Uh, so, uh, I, I, get, I gather though it, do, it does create certain problems for the administrator in uh, in managing the resources, deciding uh, what which service is more needed, which one is not as as needed. Uh, that's we never thought it was a problem. We did everything yeah. Yeah, right. until we had a recession. Then we had to <laughs> start thinking about it. But there wasn't right. a serious problem, uh -huh. uh, especially when you have good people who take charge of each one of these activities. Uh, we, we had uh, Larry Mann doing the uh, television network, Susan, Susan uh, O'Connor huh? doing the uh, audiovisual material. Uh, we had Mark Carroll doing publications. I might add, we didn't mention this, that there have been many progeny of the practical lawyer. There, there, there are other periodicals that come along, the practical litigator, the practical uh, state planner, uh, uh, several other practical magazines that were spin-offs. And the same thing happened in audio tapes. We didn't confine the audio tapes to tapes and programs. We started uh, audio tape periodicals, as it were, and we should be uh, the audio uh, lawyer for general practice or in the other real audio and real estate audio and state planning and like, likes of that. Mm -hmm. Some of that I get, uh, was a response to the greater specialization in the profession, oh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. having, having those specialized uh, publications, whereas right. I guess back in the 50s there were more, many more solo general practitioners. Um, now, another thing that's happened, I suppose, with, 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 with education in recent years uh, is uh, the, the widespread, almost universal development of, uh, of mandatory CLE education. I know you, uh, have in the past, have been skeptical about mandatory CLE. Do you still feel that way? Or? Well, not only was skeptical, I strongly opposed it. I still feel that way. I right. think it's contrary to the notion of professionalism, to a learned profession, uh -huh. and uh, I just... The evidence I see of it is that uh, lawyers take courses, uh, but so, and some very frequently they wait till the end of a period when they have to meet the requirement, and they all rush in and take whatever is available. They may practice tax law, but if the course is admiralty law, they'll take the admiralty course. Uh, I just don't think uh, mandatory is. Uh, the way to uh, treat a learned profession. I know it's uh, certain other professions, but I think it's really unfortunate to have it among, for lawyers. Mm -hmm. so, so you still feel that uh, we, education would be better if, if, if it weren't for these uh, uh, easy mandatory programs that drive well, the, better Well, not only that, but one of the, one of the things that's happened, uh, you might call mandatory education, They've call, called new tax acts, Lawyers Full Employment Act. Mm -hmm. Well, mandatory education is in the sense of Full Employment Act. Uh, they set up a separate committee with a separate administrator, and they have to have separate computers. Mm -hmm. And the cost of administering a mandatory program is very substantial. How do they recover the cost? They have to increase the tuition. Increase the tuition, or the lawyers not going to lawyers pass it on to their clients, so it raises, in a sense, the cost of legal services all the way down the line. Mm -hmm. in, in general, are you, are, are you optimistic about the future of uh, continuing legal education? Do you see any particular problems? That there are always problems, I'm sure, but any, any major problems that, 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 uh, that on the horizon now? Or? Well, I'm sure there, that there are problems. I think the future depends on uh, the people that sponsor continuing legal education, how much imagination and creativity they have, how much foresight. Uh, there's some great work being done in it in various countries around the world. Uh, Canada has an interesting program, Australia has. In some respects, uh, they've gone beyond what most of the jurisdictions do. They have these programs for new lawyers that uh, they're required to take a practice program for a certain period of time after uh, completing their law school. And uh, these make for better practitioners. So uh, what happens in the future? Well, it depends on the lawyers that 
run the bar associations and the committees they set up to run continuing legal education and the kind of administrators that are hired to do it and the economics of it. Well, there's, there's no doubt that uh, uh, whatever happens in the future, uh, your, your work with Aliyah will have a tremendous influence on it and for, for the good. Uh, I, I, uh, perhaps we should uh, move back. We jumped way ahead, and maybe we should move back a little bit to the uh, to, to ALI and sure. uh, and some of the uh, uh, things that were happening in your in the early days with the, with the institute. Uh, did you want to take? a Well, break I thought or? it was interesting. If I interrupt, uh, that uh, I looked again at the uh, report of that committee on future work of the institute, mm -hmm. and. Uh, this was in 46, 45 and 46. They mapped out a program that, in a sense, is still being implemented. implemented. For example, one of the things, a restatement of mortgages. Well, we just recently... They talked about that? Yeah, we started a restatement of mortgages. Mm -hmm. They spoke about uh, work in criminal law, and that, that, of course, led... Then we did the model penal code business associations, we had corporations. They uh, listed, uh, interestingly, that more work should be done in property. And one of the subjects, they said there ought to be a restatement of landlord and tenant. And sure enough, years later, Jim Kasner became the reporter for landlord and tenant. And there ought to be uh, a restatement dealing with uh, states, I think, and wills. And uh, that's going forward now. Right. So, uh, the so this was a blueprint. Of, for the, huh? This was a real blueprint. Yeah, for the, the members of that committee had good imagination and real foresight to list all this work that has to be done, and, and uh, they laid a blueprint out, which uh, has, as you mentioned yesterday, a restatement of international law of work. Uh, I know ALI now has a, a program committee uh, that passes on programs from day to day ad hoc, but it might not be a bad idea to have at some point another committee on the future of the Institute in the 21st century, what kind of projects it might undertake. Mm -hmm. To really take the long-range view. Yeah, and, long, and emulate uh, what was done uh, more than almost 50 years ago in planning for the future and planning ideas that might not be carried out for 30, 40 years, but when the Institute thinks that once another project, uh, I know the present director has a number of items on the agenda, but it uh, would be well to have a comprehensive overview of what might be done in the next 50 years. Good suggestion. Good part of those 50 years may be spent just doing the restatement of torts again, but there are plenty of other things, obviously, to do as well. Well, if you look at the, I was looking at the reports in 1947, 48, and 49, and it's, uh, it's interesting how the program has expanded. Uh, the work then was, uh, every year there was a report on the Youth Correction Authority Act, and uh, there was, uh, the work was starting on federal taxation and keeping the restatement up to date, uh, which these interim work. But that, that was uh, a very narrow program, and gradually it expanded. Uh, uh, in the Goodrich administration. Uh, when, when Goodrich died, I think, in 1962, uh, the, the idea of a model land development code had been uh, approved, and I think the idea of a pre-arraignment code of procedure had been approved. Uh, and uh, her, when Herb Wexler came in, he was very successful in getting funding for those projects that they were able to go forward. But if you compare the, uh, the work uh, in 47, it's been like uh, you're, you're looking at the base of a vase that expands yeah. upward, and it's just getting bigger and bigger. The division of jurisdiction was, uh, was another Goodrich-inspired right. project, uh, yeah, wasn't yeah. it, because of his, it his federal that. interest and background? Yeah. Well, uh, back in the old days, the Institute had done a study of criminal code of criminal procedure. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, one of the things I very early did was made a compilation of how many states had adopted provisions of that. 
when I first started Winnie Institute. And, but the, the groundwork was being prepared for work in the future. I mean, this notion that the Institute had finished its mission it was just incorrect. Uh, there, there was an agreement with the commissioners as we, to draft a uniform commercial code. And uh, while they were working on articles separately, uh, as I said yesterday, uh, Bill Strader put it together with the scissors and paste and made a uniform, com the uniform commercial code out of it. And uh, there, there's uh, much to be done. And what about the the, uh, the second uh, restatement? You'd mentioned before, of course, there was there was talk about the institute having nothing more to do, and but it clearly became obvious that there was there was plenty to do with uh, uh, with the restatements because these things tend to get out of date for a start. And uh, when it got started again in the early fifties, uh, uh, did Goodrich have any particular ideas about uh, how the second restatement might be different than the first? Oh, uh, and one of his, I think, in his forty-eight report or forty-nine report, he mentions that. It, it might be done differently, that they would cite authorities, that uh, where there was uh, division, they would take what they thought the better view, wouldn't count noses, uh, that it wouldn't be speaking ex cathedra, as he said, as much as the first restatement. Mm -hmm. And it would be a, uh, there'd be cases cited in the notes, reporters' notes. Mm -hmm. Uh, he referred to as an illustration the notes of C. V. S. Scott to the restatement of restitution, which was one of the first times that was done. And uh, that, that was carried on and in later years, Herb Wexler, when he was director, wrote an article about uh, this matter of uh, the Institute's approach to restatement work, whether it's state's law as it is or uh, does something uh, a little different. Yeah, that, that was, uh, I guess, precipitated by, some, by the uh, restatement of torts, wasn't it? Uh, some, some people felt that, uh, that the Institute was departing from its role of, of, of stating the law as it is and suggesting what it should be, and then... That, that seems to come up in every restatement. Yeah. There, there, there are some who have this notion that the Institute should strictly state what is the law, what they think is the law. Mm -hmm. And each time, uh, the director has to explain, and, and uh, Goodrich laid the foundation for that. Wexler very eloquently elaborated in that article. What was that, in the ABA Journal? Uh, there was a version of it in the ABA Journal. I think a longer version of it was in the uh, St. Louis, uh, Louis Law Review. Law Review. And, uh, and also a speech to the Chief Justices, the, I think he delivered and Jeff Hazard has been citing that and talking about it. Uh, it keeps coming up. I guess it always will. Uh, I guess Herb Wexler's innovation of, of phrasing, anyway, about this was the, to suggest that the Institute should regard itself as being essentially in the same position of a court, the highest court in the land, uh, obviously paying attention to precedent, uh, but, but not being absolutely bound by it, and uh, also looking at policy and looking at, the, at, at, at new trends and new tendencies as well. And uh, uh, that clearly must have made a difference. Well, to thoughtful readers, it makes a difference. Yeah, but as you say, the, the other, other people... That, maybe that, ought to, that article ought to be uh, condensed and be a preface to each tentative draft. That's a, that's a good thought. You know, what else is, is going to happen, I believe, is uh, Jeff Hazard just a week or two ago suggested that uh, the quotation from Wexler about that should be put on the wall uh, in the meeting room downstairs so that all the advisors can, can see it uh, as, they, as they work on it, because many times when advisors come in to work on a project, they're not fully aware of the, no. this latitude. That, that should even be put into the, uh, each draft on, uh, in, on the uh, page, I mean, so that the members are aware of it. Mm -hmm. that's a th uh, that's it becomes a dogma rather than something has to be pulled out whenever somebody it's unhappy that we're making mm -hmm. new law, not restating. Right. I think the trouble f flows from the name restatement. Uh, many people take an hour view of what it means. To restate something means to restate it, not to yeah. newly state something. But yeah. to well, it, I guess it can be taken two ways. If you restate something, it can mean stating it over again, or it can mean stating it in a new way. And, and clearly, we we uh, we we have the concept that, it, that it's got, that it's more than simply stating it the same way, it's got to be stated in a clearer way, in a, right. in, and hopefully a better way. 
Um, well, uh, uh, you mentioned Herb Wexler already, and uh, I, we, we should probably talk about the uh, first uh, his tremendous influence, which you observed first of all as a reporter, as the chief reporter for the Model Penal Code, and then uh, later on as uh, as director. Uh, well, he, he, well, the Penal Code, uh, he really uh, got together a symphony of lawyers and orchestrated it beautifully. He had all the disciplines represented. He had a sociologist, he had criminologist, he had psychiatrist, even had an English professor. Lionel de Trilling, I think it was. Uh, uh, dealing with it, and uh, he ran a tight ship as the uh, director, but very excellent reporter. He always paid attention to what the uh, council, what the advisors were thinking, the council was thinking, and the membership. And he would make a presentation that would cover all aspects and uh, by by the conclusion. Jeff Hazard was a great reporter too when he took over restatement of judgments mm -hmm. and uh, was very impressive in the way he handled the subject. So, Good preparation for becoming a director, I guess. Yeah, Be a good well, reporter first. Goodrich had been a reporter also uh, on various parts of torts. And, uh, in fact, he, he was the reporter on uh, keeping the restatement of torts up to date, that interim, mm -hmm. one of the reporters in torts. Was torts or conflict of laws? One or the other. And uh, he had an interesting way of, when, when he was judge, a judge and hearing an appeal, it was like conducting a class. You know, we asked the questions. And the same, when he was director, he uh, at advisory committee meetings, he, he would summarize when necessary and move the meeting along very uh, as efficiently as he did it worked. You talked about uh, how well uh, uh, Herb Wexler orchestrated uh, the model penal code. Uh, uh, was that uh, project uh, uh, controversial? Was there a lot of pressure uh, put on the Institute for some of the positions that were being taken or lobbying or was there, or, or, uh, some of those some of those points uh, I imagine would, uh, today would be great Flashpoints like uh, the, the the view on abortion and uh, uh, maybe the death penalty and, the, well, they were. and so forth. They were uh, abortion, the death penalty. Uh, I think on a death penalty, they decided to take a vote, non-binding vote of the members. Uh, and on abortion, they reached some kind of I don't remember the details. Uh, compromise solution. Uh, but these were, were rather. Uh, uh, Progressive views for the time, I think, and later on they they uh, they, they weren't intended as constitutional law, obviously, but the, they clearly influenced the developments in constitutional law, both the death penalty and the uh, well, the insanity test was another big issue. Tests were defense right. of insanity, and uh, very influential uh, formulation, obviously. Now Wexler was uh, did a superb job on the penal code. And uh, thereafter, when he became director, uh, brought the same insights, intelligence and to every project when he sat on advisory committee meetings or the council meetings and likes of that. This has been very fortunate, the quality of its directors. Was uh, uh, Wexler's style markedly different from Goodrich's uh, as director? Yes, Wexler was in a sense, more verbal than Goodrich. And by that I mean, uh, uh, you read a Goodrich report and it's marked by uh, brevity and pithiness. A uh, Wexler report has uh, overlays of intellectual content uh, that he works very hard at de developing. Uh, so, uh, very careful, precise writer. Uh, well, very careful. Yeah. He's, he writes everything, he, as I recall, he writes he, both these things out longhand and uh, very s s straight, small writing and very specific. And, it, it, and for him, I, I think he, it was a, a worthwhile but hard working uh, effort. Uh, and the results showed. Uh, in his writings and the articles he has, and that uh, those talk that 
Holmes lecture at Harvard and, and, and uh, other works. Uh, he was made a uh, very significant contribution to institute work. And uh, with it all, there was a certain amount of conviviality and especially advisory committee meetings. Uh, and golf was an yeah. important element of every meeting where it went possible. as was uh, hospitality. Uh, when, uh, there was a, an interim period uh, between the, uh, the death of Goodrich, which I guess was rather sudden, and... Uh, and, yeah, and Goodrich that. went in to have a hip replacement at the University Hospital. Mm -hmm. He had severe arthritis and had great pain walking, and he finally decided to have a, it, it replaced, which today is a pretty routine operation. Mm -hmm. And he went to Penn and uh, apparently uh, had the operation. It was successful. And thereafter, a couple of days later, he had an embolism. Mm. That, uh, I remember getting a call very, very, very early in the morning from his daughter that her father had died. And, uh, and uh, so that was obviously was a tremendous shock to the Institute and to, and, and, and to you. And there was then a period of transition before uh, Herb Wexford became the director, although he had just finished the, uh, coincidentally at that time, I guess he had just finished the model penal code. Uh, but, but as I understand it, uh, you were in effect uh, not only taking over at that period as the director of Aliaba, but for a while you, were, you had to be the, at least the interim director of ALI too until, uh, until Wexford came out. So that must have been a really uh, busy period for you. Good, good, good summary. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, uh, obviously, uh, uh, your relationship with with Wexford would have been a different sort than than, than with uh, with uh, with Goodrich, because Goodrich was your mentor in a, in a way. In well, a, it was different in other respects. See, Goodrich was in Philadelphia. Yeah. And while he didn't spend most of his time at the office, he would come out about once a week or once every two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, Wexler was in New York. And uh, most of the communication was by telephone. Occasionally, I would go up there, or the advisors meeting, we'd see him. So uh, that that was different. And uh, I didn't know Wexler as well as I knew Goodrich when Wexler came in as director. And the relationship developed over the years. And uh, we, used, after when Wexler became director, we had uh, many meetings that. Uh, New York, but Herb picked the Westbury Hotel, which was uh, nearby then, and that became our meeting place for most of the advisory committee meetings. And uh, people liked it. There was some nice hotel in a good location. Mm -hmm. Then, then the summertime, th there would be meetings at uh, some resort-type places. Uh, not too many of them, but occasionally. Mm -hmm. We used to meet, when Jim Kastner came in, we would meet frequently at the, uh, there's a country club outside Atlantic City, Seaview Country Club, which had two golf courses, and it made for very pleasant meetings. Now the meetings are almost invariably here in Philadelphia, which of course in our offices, which are much more efficient, but uh, that, that uh, Maybe some of that congenial atmosphere is, 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 uh, has, is lost as a result. Well, I don't know. The new president has some ideas about travel. Yeah, well, that's right. There was that unfair competition meeting. Uh, he won, they, they wanted a final meeting at, that would be at a it's resort Seaview. area. Right. So they met in, down in Georgia. Right, at Seaview. Uh -huh. No, not Seaview. It's, it's Seaview. Is, is it Seaview? Yeah, I think so. But uh, also during that period when uh, when uh, Wexford came in as president and you as a director, I mean as director, uh, there, a new president took over right about that time too. Uh, Norris Darrell succeeding uh, Harrison Tweed, uh, 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 and did that change the dynamics of the leadership of the institute? Uh, well, they, they were uh, each president was a distinct personality. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't president when George Wharton Pepper was president, but I attended 
some annual meetings when he and council meetings when he was chair of the council and mm -hmm. Judge Wharton Pepper had his own style. It was almost Emperor Pepper and he very grand and beautiful way of doing things. Harrison Tweed came in and was considerably less formal. Uh, he introduced uh, to his lasting credit uh, a reception with real liquor instead of <laughs> punch. And uh, he made that big change when he became president of the Association of Bar City of New York. He, he made that a lively pace. Uh,